Good morning. On behalf of the Partnership for Strong Communities, welcome to the 2024 Connecticut Affordable Housing Conference. My name is Chelsea Ross, Executive Director here at the Partnership. At the partnership, we've spent more than 25 years working to shape solutions to housing issues in Connecticut through advocacy, research, and convening. We work to support a shared vision for Connecticut's housing future. We are policy experts and change makers. We serve as a trusted source of information to build public will, and we develop and leverage relationships with and between partners, sectors, and communities. We envision a Connecticut where everyone has a safe, stable home, that's affordable to them in an equitable community of their choice. Our guiding principle is that housing is a human right. We are here for housing, housing access, housing equity, and housing justice. Our mission is carried out through partnerships. We facilitate, nurture, and leverage crucial relationships because we are stronger and more impactful when we are united. We are committed to policies and practices that reduce disparities in housing and within our organization. We ground our work in facts that we use to dispel myths, challenge stereotypes, and fill in gaps in knowledge to drive narrative, policy, and systems change. And we prioritize solutions that will be affordable and sustainable long-term. We focus on the full spectrum of housing needs and experiences of communities now and for generations to come. We work to impact change with and in support of individuals and families across the housing stability continuum. As a result of our work, fewer people should experience being unhoused or unstably housed or living in temporary, unaffordable, or unsafe housing conditions. Everyone in Connecticut should have access to a home they can afford that is safe and healthy and in thriving communities. So how do we realize this vision? A healthy housing system requires a holistic approach that integrates housing affordability, creation, choice, and stability. Everyone deserves to afford a home without sacrificing their other basic needs. We must expand the supply of homes in our state and ensure a variety of housing options exist in every community. People deserve protection from instability, eviction, and homelessness. This is how we build a system that truly reflects the needs of our children, our families, and our communities. Connecticut has the 14th highest median housing cost and the 13th highest median rents nationwide. In 2023, over 400,000 households, home renters and homeowners experienced housing cost burden, meaning they're forced to spend more than 30% of their income on housing costs. This includes over 96,000 extremely low income households that rent their home who are forced to spend more than half of their income on their housing costs. The Connecticut Housing Finance Authority has helped us put a finer point on our need, reporting that the state has a shortage of 92,500 affordable homes for low-income households alone. Connecticut also has the fifth oldest housing stock in the U.S., with nearly 230,000 public housing units needing investment and many privately owned homes in similar disrepair. More than 5,000 publicly supported rental homes face expiring affordability restrictions in the next five years. As our household sizes decline and shift, demand for diverse housing options in our state continues to grow, yet Connecticut's multifamily housing starts remain low. In 2023, the state ranked 40th in housing permits in the country. Across the state, fewer than 6.5% of homes are regulated or subsidized affordable housing, a level that has remained unchanged over the past 13 years. There are only 37 rental homes affordable and available for every 100 extremely low income households. So how much do you need to afford housing here in Connecticut? Well, the average fair market rent or FMR for a two bedroom apartment is $1,779. This is a state average and the cost is often significantly higher in certain parts of the state with portions of Fairfield County exceeding $2,600 per month. In order to afford this level of rent and utilities without paying more than 30% of your income on housing, a household must earn over $5,850 monthly or more than $70,000 annually. This translates to an hourly wage of $34.54 to afford the average two bedroom apartment in Connecticut. This is well above the Connecticut minimum wage of $15.69 and the average hourly wage for many households that hold critical jobs like childcare workers, healthcare aides, wait staff, and many more. 
In fact, the median renter wage in Connecticut is $20.30, which is not only well below what is needed to afford a two-bedroom apartment, but also below what is need, needed to afford a one-bedroom apartment. Many of us in this virtual space today hear these facts on a regular basis. Many of us live these facts on a daily basis, and all of us are impacted as members of our local, regional, and state communities. No parent should have to choose between paying the rent and paying for diapers. No senior should have to worry about being able to afford to stay in their home. No young adult should have to delay their future or career because of a lack of affordable housing options. No family should live in an unsafe or unhealthy home as a result of continuous disinvestment in their community. No child should have to repeatedly change schools because their family is struggling to maintain stable housing. No one should be sleeping outside. No one should have to bear the weight of housing instability resulting from systemic failures. This is why we are here today, to continue to work together to drive policies, practices, and investments that foster affordability, increase our housing supply, expand choice across all communities, and support housing stability. 2024 marks our fifth year of hosting the CAHC. We started in 2020 during the early months of the pandemic when Zoom was the safest place to convene. And we've continued to gather here virtually over the past five years to learn, share, and collaborate. Across these five years, we've hosted 120 conference sessions. Each year we've watched the CAHC grow, not only in size, but in impact. We moved from 300 attendees in our first year to more than 600 attendees last year and more than 600 folks who've registered to participate over the next two days. This year, we will welcome 100 local, state, and national experts as speakers over the next two days. Together, we've built a platform that strengthens our knowledge and our collective commitment to address housing issues across our state and ensure that affordable homes remain a top priority. Each of you has played a vital role in building this momentum. And as we celebrate this milestone, we also recognize that our work is more important than ever. The recent election means that our national housing policies will shift. We anticipate impacts on funding and regulatory frameworks. We expect to see changes in approaches to housing finance, rental assistance, and policies related to zoning and land use. We anticipate fair housing protections to face reckless and deeply harmful erosion. These changes will require us to be adaptive, to strengthen our advocacy, and to be vigilant and responsive to protect and expand the progress we have made in Connecticut. This is a time to strengthen our individual, organizational, and collective commitment to this work. Connecticut can set a powerful example for inclusive, community-centered solutions that address our most pressing housing needs. We can be a place where everyone has a home. Between today and tomorrow, you'll have access to more than two dozen opportunities between keynotes, plenaries, and breakout sessions to hear about a wide array of best practices, collaborations, and coordinated advocacy strategies. I encourage all of you to engage fully, ask questions, challenge your assumptions, envision new possibilities for our housing future. We hope you will join in on the conversation here and also at hashtag CAHC2024 across social. We have some amazing sessions lined up for you today. In just a minute, you'll hear from our opening keynote speaker, Jerusalem Demsis, more about Jerusalem in a moment. We'll have a break from 11 to 11.30 and meet back here on Zoom for a plenary legislative roundtable. Following another 30 minute break, starting at 1 p.m. through 4 p.m., we will head into breakout sessions. We have 11 sessions to choose from, full of local, state, and national experts, talking about everything from available state resources to racial equity and development, to tenant organizing and more. We are working to keep breakout sessions to 50 minutes this year to give all of us some built-in break time in between. Tomorrow, we'll meet back here on Zoom at 9.30 to hear from Brian McCabe and Eva Rosen as they speak about the key learnings and insights from their recently released book, The Sociology of Housing. After a short lunch break, we'll be tuning in to learn from mayors across Connecticut as they discuss innovative approaches to repositioning underutilized commercial spaces and land into vital housing opportunities. Again, from one to three, we have another quality set of breakout sessions lined up for you from young voices leading in housing advocacy to direct cash models, to low income housing tax credits and everything in between. 
The conference closes online at 4 p.m. And we're looking forward to many of you joining us for our in-person network and reception at our home at the Lyceum in Hartford tomorrow evening starting at 5 p.m. where we'll also be recognizing our 2024 Here for Housing Ambassadors. We are proud to recognize these amazing people for their advocacy, leadership, and unwavering dedication to the housing movement. If you'd like to join us, you can still purchase a ticket online. We hope you will explore the full conference agenda and plan out a schedule that most interests you. You can see what's coming next in the lobby at any time. There's also a PDF version of the conference agenda pinned in the lobby chat. It is important to note that all sessions will be recorded with the exception of one breakout session that we're not able to record. And those recordings will be made available on our YouTube channel post-conference. So if you just can't choose between breakout sessions or you miss something, you'll be able to catch up with them later. I wanna take a minute to introduce you to the amazing team here at the partnership and to thank them. It is impossible to overstate their dedication and passion. They have worked extremely hard to put together another amazing conference this year, particularly Danielle Hubley, our advocacy and education manager, who has seen to every detail of the next two days. I am both proud and grateful to support this team. Thank you to Amy, Alicia, Sean, Danielle, Samila, Carleen, Michelle and Kayla, who you will see throughout the conference, making sure that sessions go off without a hitch. Thank you also to our behind the scenes heroes, Jane, and of course, Greta and Don, who keep everything running smoothly. We could not do what we do without them. As always, none of this is possible without the support of our generous sponsors who make the Connecticut Affordable Housing Conference a success and free for you to attend today. Thank you to our presenting sponsor and a deeply critical partner in our work, the Connecticut Housing Finance Authority or CHAFA. CEO Nanthani Natrajan and, and CHAFA have been deeply supportive of the CAHC since its inception, not just through sponsorship, but through delivering and participating in countless sessions. We'd like to thank our visionary sponsor, Wells Fargo. Partnership is proud to have Terry Floyd, Vice President and Senior Social Impact Specialist at Wells Fargo as our Board of Director Chair and as a partner in our work. Thank you to our champion sponsors, the Connecticut Department of Housing, Liberty Bank, Robinson & Cole, Trinity Financial, J.D. Amelia Associates, and Cone Resnick. We also have seven fantastic foundation sponsors, M&T Bank, Hinkley Allen, Beacon Communities, the Federal Home Loan Bank of Boston, Capital for Change, and Connecticut Investment Advisors. And thank you to all of our investors, which made it possible for us to bring you more than two dozen sessions across two days. We'll be thanking an investor sponsor or two at each session. Okay. And finally, thank you to our supporters. Each of our generous sponsors are featured and linked on their website. You can head to the conference webpage to learn more about each of their work and how you might partner with them. These are the folks that are making investments of time, talent, and treasure to change the housing trajectory here in Connecticut. If you'd like to support the CAHC or the Partnership for Strong Communities, you can make a donation. You can scan the QR code on your screen or you can text here for housing, all caps, no spaces to 44321. All donations of $10 or more through the end of the month are entered into a raffle featuring some amazing Hartford businesses. There's a basket valued at more than $1,000. And those of you who are attending um, the reception will be able to uh, view the, the basket in person. Lastly, please take a moment to fill out our session surveys. After each session you attend, you'll get a little notification in the top right-hand corner of the Zoom events lobby, right above the lobby chat. It'll take about 30 seconds to complete the survey and your feedback really helps us improve the conference in the future. Okay, this gathering of minds and voices today is one way we push forward a vision for housing in Connecticut that is resilient and adaptable regardless of political shifts. Thank you for being here, for your commitment, and for the passion you bring to the work of making affordable, stable housing a reality for all. With that, it is my pleasure to now introduce the keynote speaker for the fifth annual CAHC, Jerusalem Demsis. Jerusalem is a staff writer at The Atlantic and is an established voice on the housing crisis and local democracy. Her writing spans issues from infrastructure, labor economics, and federalism to race, gender, mobility, and the politics of exclusion. She's also the host of the Atlantic's policy podcast, Good on Paper, one of my favorites. Jerusalem was recently recognized for her work by the American Society of Magazine Editors, ASME, 
with the ASME Next Award for Journalists Under 30, and she was also a visiting fellow with the Center for Economy and Society at the SNF Agora Institute at Johns Hopkins University. Prior to writing at The Atlantic, she was a policy journalist at Vox, where she also co-hosted the popular policy podcast, The Weeds. Her book of essays on the housing crisis, Land Development Democracy, delves into America's severe and complex housing crisis. Jerusalem challenges conventional wisdom and confronts the institutional, cultural, and political bar barriers that continue to obstruct meaningful housing reform. On the Housing Crisis is a clarion call for reimagining land use, governance, and democracy in pursuit of housing justice. Everyone here at the partnership has a copy. Danielle has shared out a link where you can purchase a copy if you're interested in the resources section of the webinar. I encourage folks to put questions for Jerusalem in the Q&A box at any time, and we'll take some time to work through audience questions later in the session. And with that, I'll welcome Jerusalem Demsis to the floor. Hi, thank you so much for that introduction. I'm so excited to be here with you all, um, albeit virtually. I do need to come to uh, Connecticut at some point. I Last time I reported on Connecticut, it was in, um, I believe, October or November 2020. So it was deep in the throes of the pandemic. And so I did all my reporting virtually. Um, but, you know, I first want to say thank you to the Partnership for Strong Family, uh, Strong Communities for inviting me here today and to all of you for taking the time on a Monday morning. Um, all of you, I know, are deeply involved or um, care deeply about the crisis of affordable housing in this country. Um, I learned so much from practitioners, advocates, uh, developers, um, uh, people who work in financing affordable housing, people who work in policy and local government and state government. And so um, all of my thinking and writing on this topic would not be possible if it weren't for people like you um, really talking about these issues and making them uh, and amplifying the voices of people who have been the most impacted. And that is the people at the bottom end of the rental market. Those are the folks who I always keep in my mind, in my work when I'm thinking about these issues. Um, so today I'm gonna talk about the need to build millions more homes in the United States um, as quickly as possible. And when I have an opportunity to talk about this issue um, across the country in a variety of venues, um, I will often have people ask, you know, why didn't you talk about the right to counsel an eviction court? Or why haven't you spoken more about the need for energy efficient and resilient housing? And um, what I would like to convince you of by the end of my remarks today and, and in the Q&A um, that we'll have after I'm finished speaking, is that not only are those issues extremely important, but every single issue that intersects with housing and the ability for people to live full, just lives and have access to the types of, of lives they want to live rests on there being enough homes that exist in the first place. Um, how many more people require lawyers in eviction courts because we haven't built enough affordable housing? How many people, how, how costly um, have we made it to build new climate resilient housing and other infrastructure by making it difficult to build housing in the first place? Every single housing justice issue, whether it's about the power imbalance between landlords and tenants, whether it's about how tenants are treated in eviction court, whether it's about the price of housing, um, the price of home ownership, whether it's about the institutional investors buying homes in the housing market and using those um, for rent, all of these issues are at core beginning with the problem of undersupply. And so that's what I'm going to talk about today. And, um, you know, Personally, I always like to start with how I became involved and interested in this work. And I think like everyone, once you start hearing about housing policy, you start reflecting on your own life and how housing policies have shaped the trajectory of what was possible for you. And, you know, there's a tendency I think people have to sometimes when they're asked, you know, why do you work on something to maybe over narrativize their own life? So I'll try not to do that. Forgive me if I do. Um, but I came to this country when I was three years old. My family and I, we were asylum seekers from Ethiopia. My family is Eritrean and we moved to Maryland. 
And um, the outskirts of Maryland in Montgomery County, uh, sorry, the outskirts of the DC metropolitan area in Montgomery County, Maryland, um, there are a lot of very good schools. And my parents were very intent on raising their children in a very good school district. And so they tried to, you know, they didn't know the area very well. So they just tried to restrain themselves to zip codes um, where they could see good, good schools um, for their kids to go to. And um, but unsurprisingly, they found very few options for housing. Um, the one place they did find, they found a townhome for rent, and um, it was in a very exclusionary community suburb of Maryland called Potomac, Maryland. And later in my life, when I reflected back, I was confused. Like, why did this very exclusionary community, mostly large, giant single-family homes on more than one acre of land. Why were there these townhomes? Um, and I looked into it, and it was an inclusionary zoning program that had been created in order to make it possible for middle-income and working-class Americans to also have access to the quality neighborhoods that exist in the Maryland suburbs. And then later on in my life, my parents got divorced when I was in high school and, um, you know, we were attending a public school, but it was a magnet program in Montgomery County. And in order to be able to attend that school, you needed to be able to have access to the bus routes unless your parents were able to drive you, which mine weren't because they were both working full time. And being able to afford both the house that we were currently living in and a new place to live inside the same county felt impossible until my father found an apartment complex um, that was walking distance from my school. Um, it was not a popular building when it was first proposed. People didn't want to see multifamily development in um, Montgomery County, Maryland. And it was pushed forward by county councilmen, uh, county council members who were committed to the idea of there being um, multifamily market rate housing that would become accessible, more accessible to average people. As a result of that housing option, I was able not only to maintain my relationship with both my parents by being able to live near both of them and in both of those houses, but also continuity in my own schooling and my sister's schooling and my little brother's schooling. And I think this is one of those most important points that I think that, you know, people often miss because I think on the left, there is a tendency to want to say every individual project needs to have a specific beneficiary in mind when you actually um, are planning it. But no one planned for me. No one thought, I know that Jerusalem Demsis is seven years old right now and that she's going to need a place to live because her parents will be divorced. And so we need to make sure that there are apartment buildings available for them. No, what happened is that someone allowed housing to be built that wasn't the dominant form of housing. And as a result, there were more choices available to people who needed them. My family was not at risk of eviction. We were not at risk of homelessness. I don't want to pretend like we had the same experience as some people, millions of people do all over this country. But what we were at risk of is having the architecture of our lives forever altered by the fact that some people don't like apartment buildings, some people don't want to see multifamily housing, and some people want to maintain the neighborhood character of a time where we saw mass exclusion on the basis of class and race and other immutable characteristics. So that's why I care about this issue so much. That's why I care so much about the problems of housing choice and housing abundance. But I want to start talking a little bit more about the scope of the undersupply problem, because I think a lot of people um, are shocked at how big a hole we've dug ourselves into. Now, these sorts of estimates are very, very hard to kind of keep consistent because, of course, um, housing needs are dynamic and they're cultural. If more people are staying single longer and they don't want to have roommates, that means you're going to have increases in housing demand than in a world where people are getting married younger. Um, and if people are less likely to have children, that might decrease housing demand. But as best as we're able to tell, we are minimum 4 million housing units under what we need to be in order to provide accessible housing at a reasonable price to people across this country. 4 million homes is a lot of homes. We build about roughly one to one and a half million a year, but that's not even, we're not even talking about that average. We're talking about 4 million above the number that we're regularly building. So why is it so hard for us to build enough housing to meet the demand of the United States of America? The primary cause of housing undersupply are the regulations and procedures that are hostile to the development of new housing. When we think about zoning, when we think about land use regulations, when we think about the permitting process in this country, I think the most important place to start from is you can just tell that it is created, that these rules and procedures and laws are created from the perspective of individuals who are hostile to new development. 
It's not a process that is saying we want more housing to exist. We just want you to make sure you're you're file you're you know checking some boxes to make sure we're following safety and health violations. No, most housing types in this country are presumed guilty, and then they have to prove themselves worthy of being developed. But that's exactly backwards. When we need something important in this country, we don't presume that it's bad. We presume that it's good and force people to explain why it's harmful to a community. We have it exactly backwards with housing, particularly with affordable housing, but all types of multifamily housing and even small single family homes that are usually the most accessible as starter homes um, for, for people trying to become homeowners for the first time. So I think that the important thing to start from is, is the history of this, right? Because I think often people don't realize that all zoning is essentially exclusionary zoning. Um, zoning really only takes off after the Supreme Court in the 1910s rules that it is illegal for a Louisville, Kentucky to tell a white man that he's not able to sell his home to a black man because the, uh, the street that he lives on is majority white. When the Supreme Court says that that's illegal, then you see localities across the country begin to enact zoning regulations. And William Fischel, an economist, looks into the character and type of these zoning regulations and finds that before this Supreme Court decision, Buchanan v. Warley, before this Supreme Court decision, most zoning regulations that exist are primarily all about health and safety and light regulations, things that were reasonably considered to be um, tangible harms. But after the Supreme Court decision, it becomes about the types of homes that are re we want people to have. It's about enshrining the single family home. It's about excluding certain types of people from neighborhoods that we consider to be good. And so it's really important to understand that the very foundation of zoning regulations in this country, all of these regulations, whether they're minimum lot sizes or height regulations, all of these things were created for the purpose of exclusion. That doesn't mean that there's no, there can be no role for them forever, but I think it's important to start from that standpoint to realize these are not neutral. They were created for the purpose of making it difficult for working class people, particularly of specific racial backgrounds, Black people and particularly Chinese Americans in, in uh, the West Coast to have access to um, affordable housing in the places where there are good jobs. So let's take kind of one ubiquitous regulation because I want to really draw out exactly how these regulations increase the price of housing and reduce the supply of housing in this country. Minimum lot sizes. I'm sure most of you are familiar with these, but minimum lot sizes essentially prescribe how much uh, uh, how much a specific lot of land has, how large it has to be for each individual house to sit on. So, you know, you could have a minimum uh, to, for, for, for reference, like starter homes used to be anything from 800 square feet to 1500 square feet. When we're thinking about the starter homes that boomers were getting access to in the post-war period, they were probably 1500, 1600 square feet tops. Now we have minimum lot sizes that are maybe 10 times that, 10,000 square feet. In some places, one to two acres, a minimum lot size. So obviously, if you tell a developer that they're only allowed to put one lot of land on one acre of land, on 10,000 square feet of land, they're going to want to maximize their return. And that means you're preferencing the development industry towards building larger homes all the time. And because you're building larger homes on the same amount of land, you're essentially shrinking the available supply of housing as well. And what's really interesting is we're able to look into the specific regulation. Um, and there's a really great research that came out, I believe last year by Joseph Giorco, who's at the University of Pennsylvania. And what he and his researchers do is they look at thousands and thousands of communities across this country, um, and they have created a land use regulatory index. And looking specifically at minimum lot sizes, and they look at border communities, so places with less restrictive and more restrictive minimum lot sizes across a specific border. And they're able to find that there is a significant impact on the size of housing, the number of single family homes, is 11% lower on average in the most restricted communities compared to the least restricted communities. And when we think about the cost that we're levying on individuals, home prices are nearly $30,000 higher in the more regulated areas with higher minimum, oh, uh, yeah, with higher minimum lot sizes than with lower. This is just for one of the very many zoning and permitting regulations that we have created. $30,000 higher. 
And I think it's really important to see how much that can build because we're talking about not just minimum lot sizes, but FAR regulations, parking requirements. And then on top of that, a variety of regulations that are much more inchoate. It's whether or not a historic preservation committee is going to weigh in and decide, actually, you need to have a bunch of different aesthetic changes to your plan in order to build an additional dwelling unit in your backyard. Or the fact that someone might be able to sue and say that the environmental permitting process wasn't properly followed, even if they can't actually prove that there is some harm to the environment. So I think really setting the stage here and explaining that many, many of these regulations are, are extremely costly is important. And often when I talk like this, some people, they get a bit confused. You know, I'm, I'm a liberal person. I write for a liberal magazine. And, you know, they're like, you know, this sounds like Republican deregulation. Um, how is that the solution to a problem when, you know, many people who are concerned about this, particularly in liberal states, are on the left? And I think a few things. First, I think it is a big disservice that we've done intellectually to pretend that our, all regulations are progressive. Clearly, this isn't true. When we think about the civil rights movement, you could cast that in many ways as a deregulatory movement. They're saying regulations that are prescribing that individuals can't be married to one another, regulations that say that people can't live together of different races, can't sell across racial lines. These are deregulatory. Regulations can be both bad and can be good. The question is, what are they created and intended to do? And how are they behaving in order to restrain or benefit the lives of people in this country? And it's very clear at this point, it's decades and decades of work has been done to show that the form and content of land use regulations is primarily to increase the, the cost of housing and lower the supply of housing. I also want to talk a little bit about the impact on sprawl here, right? So we have a lot of different things that occur. Um, and, you know, people will say, you know, if there's been uh, you know, land use regulations since the 1910s, why is the modern affordability problem crisis, why is that so new? Why are we only seeing these massive increases in home prices now? Um, and I think there are a few things here. We really only build out the American suburbs in the post-war era. Similarly to right now, when soldiers are returning from World War II, we have a 4 million home shortage. There hasn't really been any building of housing since before the Great Depression, um, and there was no great stimulation of housing demand or even the ability to access suburban areas because there was a lack of transportation. But because post in the post-war era, we create, of course, many ways for people to access um, housing through the, the GI Bill but also there's a massive stimulus coming in from the fact that all these soldiers are returning home, they're getting married, they're wanting to have kids. We build out the American suburbs in this time period. And just as one would expect, um, people are willing to move out. You know, maybe they'll go like, okay, it's too expensive for me to live right near my job, but I'm willing to live 20 minutes away, 30 minutes away. And slowly and slowly, we build out the American suburbs, exurbs, and are able to give people access to housing, but also are creating problems with sprawl and maybe not creating the best form of housing. And so a lot of people decide that what you need to do is create urban growth boundaries. We need to make it difficult for uh, or off limits for developers to develop outside specific suburban lines. But instead of complementing that with being able to build infill housing, being able to build inside this, this, this urban growth boundary, we maintain the restrictions that have made it difficult to build. So before, you know, there were lots of zoning restrictions, but developers were able to continue building out. Now they're neither able to build out nor they be able to build sufficiently inside of the urban growth boundaries. And so that's why you see this kind of really long term crisis developing and really coming to a head in recent decades. And I think the last thing I want to talk to when we think about the impacts of these regulations is about homelessness. Um, homelessness, of course, has many, many causes. Um, but I think that often it's important to separate out causes um, that are individual from causes that are macro at the policy level when we're thinking about on the on the level of populations, as in why is it that there are more homeless people in California than there are homeless people in Texas? Why are there more homeless people in New York than there are homeless people in Florida? Um, you know, people like to think about uh, the, there's a really great analogy that homeless researchers usually use, which is about musical chairs analogy. And the idea is if you're watching a bunch of kids play musical chairs, right? Um, 
And, you know, you see uh, the strongest, fastest, most gregarious kid each time. Uh, maybe it's a kind of like a, a rude kid who's willing to pull a chair away from another kid. Um, you know, that's the kind of kid that usually ends up winning uh, musical chairs. And you could say that, you know, some uh, one of these children lost musical chairs because they were too anxious or they were too slow or because they were disabled or because um, for, for various other reasons. But at the end of the day, the reason why people are chairless is because there aren't enough chairs. And that sort of artificial scarcity is exactly what we see in the housing market. Yes, of course, we see disproportionate harm to minorities, to disabled, to folks who have um, addiction problems, to folks who have mental health issues. But the reason that those people aren't experiencing those problems or those disadvantages within the four walls of a home is because of a scarcity of affordable housing. Without that housing, they're often exacerbated, these problems. But Clearly, for decades in this country, we didn't see the mass tent encampments, this unsheltered homelessness that we do see now. So why is this modern phenomenon happening and how do we stop it? So there's a great uh, research that's been done by Zillow economists that shows that the homelessness crisis is most acute in places with um, very low vacancy rates. Um, and economists showed that a growing number of people are forced to spend 30 percent or more of their income on rent. And when that happens, homelessness spikes. And then there's a really great book called Homelessness is a Housing Problem by uh, Greg Colburn, who is a researcher at the University of Washington. And what he does is he looks at the sort of classic ideas of why homelessness happened, things like poverty, things like mental illness, things like drug use. And he tries to just see if this even fits the data on the very basic correlation level. Before we even get to causal, can you see a correlation between high rates of mental illness and high rates of homelessness or high rates of poverty and high rates of homelessness? And time and again, there is just no correlation. Places with very high rates of poverty like Detroit, Miami-Dade County, Philadelphia, have among the lowest homelessness rates in the country. Some places with relatively low poverty rates, Santa Clara County, California, San Francisco, Boston, pretty low, home, uh, pretty low poverty rates, but relatively high rates of homelessness. The same pattern holds for unemployment rates. And then again, when you look at mental illness, states like Utah, Alabama, Colorado, Kentucky, West Virginia, Vermont, and Delaware, have high rates of mental illness, but relatively modest homelessness levels. And I think it's really important to see that these sorts of stories really implicate the policy regimes, right? Why is it then that in a place with low rates of poverty in San Francisco, in Boston, in, uh, in, in Los Angeles, are seeing these high rates of homelessness? And the answer is the correlation that you can find is between the low vacancy rates and high rental prices for affordable housing in these areas. And what's really important here too is that this really codifies what many homelessness advocates and um, people who work in trying to get people into permanent supportive housing already know. So the Los Angeles Homelessness Services Authority found that they're able to rehouse roughly 200 people every single day across the county. But more than that, more than 220 people get pushed into homelessness every single day. This isn't a question of this, there's a stock of homeless people and we just need to get them housed. It's as we're trying to house all of these people, so many people are falling into the state of homelessness that it's impossible to keep up. So the solving the problem of homelessness can't just be moving these folks into permanent supportive housing, though that's obviously a big part of it. It has to also be preventing all of these people who are currently housed from becoming homeless. And why are they becoming homeless? Why is this happening? Many of these people have jobs. They are earning a good income or a reasonable income. They may be, they're in their communities. We found through research done by Margot Cushell at um, UCSF that the vast majority of people, more than 90% of Californians who are homeless, were their last known address was in that state. These are not people who are moving and porting in from other states to be homeless in California. These are Californians and similar patterns have been found in other states as well. And so what we really need to address then is why is there such a supply crunch of housing for the lowest income uh, uh, Americans right now? So 
I think that a lot of people really struggle with the idea that market rate housing helps relieve pressure on the lower end income of the of market. But most people who work in affordable housing understand this because we talk about things like naturally occurring affordable housing. And what is naturally occurring affordable housing? Lots of the time it is, are, are there homes that used to be new and now are old and now they're accessible to people at the lower end of the re at rental market. That sort of housing has to one day be developed at a market rate. And market rate doesn't mean that it's this massive mansion, but it does mean that it is sold in the private market, developed by private market developers. And those people have to be a part of the solution. And it used to be the case that there was a lot of confusion about whether or not this was true. But now we have significant research showing that increasing the supply of market rate housing helps bolster even the lowest end of the rental market. One um, study that I like to point to is done by Evan Mast, um, who looked at the um, 52,000 re uh, residents in new multifamily buildings in large cities across America. Not only does he look at all of those residents, um, but he looks at their previous addresses. And then he looks at the current residents of those previous addresses, where did they used to live? And he looks down and down six times to find where exactly the moving chains are. So when I move into a new home, who's now moving into my home? Where did they come from, et cetera? And he finds that constructing a new market rate building that houses 100 people ultimately leads to up to 70 people to move out of below median income neighborhoods, with most of the effect happening within three years. That means that the ripple effect of new housing is really immediate. You're seeing people within a few years being able to move into more higher income, uh, middle, uh, uh, above median um, uh, apartment units and housing units across their city. And understanding the interrelation of all of the housing market is really important because it explains that we need every single type of housing to be built. We need permanent supportive housing to shelter individuals who are currently homeless. We need affordable housing that's built at 30% AMI, 40% AMI, 50% AMI, 80% AMI, 100% AMI. And then we need to make sure that the number of people who are requiring subsidized housing isn't being artificially inflated because the private market can't take care of them. 90% of Americans live in private market housing. And I find it very concerning how many people who talk about the housing issues say that they don't want any more private market housing when they themselves are benefiting from the existence of the private market housing that they currently live in. So now I want to talk about what prevents us from taking these solutions on, because I think this is a situation where most people who work in the space understand that there is an under uh, supply of housing. We need to build a lot more new housing in order to begin to tackle all of the problems in this space. The first, I think, is one that I've already started addressing, this idea of supply skepticism. So Vicki Bean, who's a researcher in New York City, um, and a, uh, a few of her colleagues work uh, have created this idea called supply skepticism. They've termed it. And what they're talking about is this idea that people are skeptical of um, the idea that new housing actually helps lower prices. This um, research was furthered by a few University of California researchers who ask, why is it that um, people don't believe in um, new housing? And they find that, you know, people are often uh, skeptical when they're asked in survey data about the idea that new housing would actually reduce rents. And this is pretty unique. Right? Like, this isn't a situation when they ask all of these people in surveys, hey, do you think that supply and demand works in the used car market? They'll say, if you think there, if there's a snag in the supply chain of used cars, what happens to the price of cars? People usually understand that means that prices go up. But something different happens when you ask them about housing. They're much more skeptical of the idea that new housing will actually improve their communities. And I think this is a really important thing to drill down into because why is it that there is that when when you see more supply skepticism in a community, you also see more resistance to new housing being developed of all types. Now, I think that this is largely because people themselves, they look around their communities and they see a lot of change. When I go back to Montgomery County, Maryland to visit family and friends, um, a lot of it looks different. 
there's a lot more development than I remember. Places that seemed empty fields, now all of a sudden there's a new, you know, small area plan that's been completed over the last couple decades. Um, and I just go, wow, so much has changed. And so for us as individuals, we're seeing a lot of change, but we're not seeing it relative to the need. At no point in my lifetime has America built as much housing per person as it was building. And actually, even on absolute terms in the cities I'm talking about, like New York City and San Francisco, these places were building way more in the post-war era than they have been building in my entire lifetime. And so I think for a lot of people, um, there is a mismatch between understanding, yes, some things are changing in my community, some things are being built, but not enough relative to the need. And of course, not the types of housing often that are going to address the needs of the most acute members of society. So I think that that is a really big problem. But I think the other problem is that when we think about how we talk about gentrification in this country, that has really impacted how people view new housing. So the traditional story, and you know, I live in Washington, D.C. now, which many re uh, neighborhoods um, with traditionally uh, middle class black um, families have gentrified significantly. And when we talk about gentrification in cities like D.C. and across the country, we say the problem of gentrification is that new people are coming in. And the problem is that these new buildings are coming up and all of a sudden I'm being priced out. And so we place the blame on the new people coming in and on the new buildings that are being built. But what we now know is that people are going to move in for good jobs and that's not a problem. It's not a bad thing that 22 year olds with college degrees are moving in to major cities. That's actually a positive. The reverse of that are places that are dying, that are losing populations that aren't job centers. But the problem comes in when new entrants to a community there's not enough room for everyone. And so the older entrants or the older incumbents in that space are forced to move out. And when does that happen? Right now, I, uh, you know, you know, one of the, um, actually not right now, but like, you know, the, the house I used to live in used to be a home that was a um, middle-class uh, family housing, had three bedrooms, clearly meant for uh, a family. It was small, but was accessible to transit. And when I moved in there, it was had been converted by a developer into two apartments um, for uh, yuppies, and both of the but both people living there were like you know young people who had reasonably good incomes, and you know were excited to live in a neighborhood but couldn't afford a larger house. The problem that people have when they oppose new housing in areas that might gentrify is not recognizing that higher income people, the markets will always respond to the needs that we have for new housing. Rich people will always get what they want, no matter what system we're creating. The question is, will we also make enough room for everyone else? When you go to New York, when you go to Brooklyn, to the Brooklyn brownstones, right, that were once castigated as being these sort of like tacky middle class homes, how do those houses become $10 million playing grounds for the elite and the ultra rich? because we didn't build enough for everyone. And so of course, when the rich moved to Brooklyn, they turned those things into massive mansions. And now it's very easy for someone to just, uh, who's very wealthy, to be able to go to a Brooklyn Brownstone and actually turn it into a single family home, tear down and down zone the amount of housing that exists. But we can't do that in the reverse to make room for more people. And I think that the conversation around gentrification really needs to shift here. We need to make it clear that the problems of gentrification when it comes to housing are not building enough. And particularly we need to make clear that the house building does not actually make changes to the cultural problems associated with gentrification. When people are afraid that new entrants in their community are going to call the police more on them, or they're worried that cultural shifts will happen that make it difficult for them to, to follow the uh, normal cultural practices they're used to in the neighborhoods, we need to make clear that new housing is actually making it easier for communities to get along, not harder. And it's really clear that when we raise the stakes of integration, because again, the opposite of gentrification, opposite of these neighborhoods where you're seeing these cultural conflicts, 
is the segregated communities that exist all over these cities. In Washington, D.C., there's no gentrification happening in Ward 7 and 8, where you see poverty and stagnation happening in a primarily Black community. There's no gentrification happening in Ward 3, where you see a complete refusal to build affordable housing or any new housing, um, and it's maintained basically a segregated suburb for affluent white people in the D.C. area. So when we turn all of our sights on the problem of all of this change, all of this shifts happening in these in um, these gentrifying communities, we ignore that the alternative is segregated communities and segregated classes. And so to me, how we improve the gentrification conversation in cities is integral to how we're going to solve the housing supply issue. People need to feel like new housing is also being built for them, that it is improving the chances of them being able to stay in their communities if they want to. And so that's, I think, a big part of the reason why we've seen difficulty in taking on the issue of supply skepticism of, of building more housing. The other thing I'll say is that there are a lot of attractive villains out there, um, Airbnb, institutional investors, private equity. It's not to say that there aren't problems in these places, particularly with Airbnb, you do see an reduction in short and long term rental options when Airbnb goes up. But we then create a conversation where it's about a fixed pool of housing and there are some bad actors we need to stop when everyone who works in this issue understands that even if there were no institutional investors, even if there were no Airbnb, there still wouldn't be enough affordable housing in New York City. But we focus so much of our energies on these attractive villains rather than actually attacking the structural problems in the housing market that are making it impossible to build enough affordable housing. And that doesn't mean shutting down people's concerns concerns about these entities, but it means saying that might be a problem, but that is not going to solve your concerns about affordability in your community. And it's extremely important that everyone who works in this space is clear on that. The other thing that I'll say is that there are a lot of competing priorities that people who work in housing or people who work in politics are just not clear on. It is the case that if you oppose private market development, you can never solve the housing crisis. It is the case that if you are wedded to local control as being the only way that housing can be developed, that you are not interested in solving the housing crisis. It is the case that if you are more committed to maintaining a specific environmental permitting process that has no effect on actually protecting the environment than you are to building housing, that you are not serious about solving the housing crisis. There needs to be a very clear prioritization here. Not every development is a good one. There's going to be some developments that where developers are corrupt or cut corners. There can be developments where, oh man, it would have been better if we'd moved it over here, or we accidentally cut off this view shed and we could have actually moved it elsewhere. But if you hold every housing development to the standard of optimizing for every concern that someone might have, you are essentially saying that nothing but the most perfect housing can ever be built. And that means only very rich people will be able to get access to that kind of housing. And that's a situation I think is untenable. So being very clear that yes, there will be some things that are missed as we're trying to build tons of new housing for as many people as possible to prevent homelessness, to prevent rising rents, to prevent inaccessible home ownership. But that that is a price worth paying because these are bigger problems right now. That is a conversation that needs to be had within political communities right now. Now, um, my book, which is on the housing crisis, is about housing, but it's also kind of secretly, not so secretly, a book about democracy. Because too often proponents of local control over land use decisions and housing um, try and own the mantle of being the more democratic side. They say, we're the ones respecting the will of the communities. We're the ones who are closest to the people. We know what's best for these spaces. And you shouldn't, as states, as the national government, you don't get to tell us what to do, how to build where to build, what to build. Now, at first blush, I'll just say this. Local governments have had significant, almost total control over land use decisions regarding the types and quantity of housing that have been built in this country for the past 50 years. And with that control, they have spurred one of the worst housing crises that have seen in a developed nation. Um, no nation is as rich as us. It is not a question of money. It is not a question of financial products. It is not a question of technical capacity. We know how to build homes just as other countries do. The decision not to build housing in this country is entirely a political one. And if local governments want to be parts of that solution, they need to accept the reality that they have been responsible for the crisis for the past 50 years. So 
But the other part of the problem is that straightforwardly, I think that the way that permitting and local government has engaged with land use has been straightforwardly anti-democratic. First, nobody votes in local government. We're talking about in many places across this country, less than 10% of people even voting for mayor. So the idea that there's a democratic relationship at the local government is clearly already broken down, even before you get into, are people voting for their city council members? Are they voting for their zoning board chairs? Do they even know who these people are? But even for those of us who are very committed to voting, we're often coming into races that are uncontested. The vast majority of local government races are uncontested in this country, which means we don't even have a meaningful choice when presented with um, the ability to vote at the ballot box. Then, even if they're contested, you're prevented from making meaningful votes because there's so little information. How am I, as an individual citizen, expected to know not just who my city council person is, who my zoning board chair is, who the historic preservation board is and who appoints them and how that happens, but also whether those decisions have been good or bad. It would be genuinely, it is a full-time job to evaluate even one of these roles. So we've created an impossible democratic standard for local government um, to meet. And I, I don't blame local government entirely for this, but I do think it's a reality we have to live in is that regular people cannot be expected to know this much in order to hold their government officials accountable. But then the problem then becomes the unrepresentativeness of people who do show up. Because when we look at the people who vote in local government, when we look at the people who actually engage in local public meetings on housing or zoning or any issue, you see a remarkably unrepresentative set of people, not from national standards even, but from the very local governments that we're talking about here. And this happens time and again in my own reporting, where I will come across a local elected who I think is an extremely kind person who's trying trying to do the right thing, who wants to solve these problems. And when you ask them questions about their community, they tell you question answers that re reveal that they are actually talking to and are from a very biased segment of society. Um, and this isn't to blame them. I mean, even if you're talking about the hyper-local, someone who's serving and, 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 and representing just 2,000 people. I mean, I do not personally know the needs and interests of 2,000 people in my brain. The idea that anyone could be expected to do that is ridiculous. And, you know, in DC, I have this, you know, one anecdote that I'll tell here, which is that I was talking to someone in one of the um, poor wards in DC, and they were a hyper local elected official, was an, uh, an uh, advisory neighborhood council commissioner. So this is someone who is at the 2,000, roughly, um, uh, re he's representing 2,000 people. And I asked them, you know, hey, why are you opposing these bike lanes? What's, what are you hearing from your community? What are their concerns? And they told me, well, nobody, you know, everyone in my community drives. And I was, I was just like, that's not, that, that can't be true. Because when I look at the DC map, when I look at the statistics that your own city publishes, they tell me that 40% of the people in this ward do not have access to a car. And this person was not a bad person. They weren't trying to ignore the needs of their own community members, but they were part and parcel of the problem that most local government officials have, which is they think that they know their community, but they only know a specific subset of people, often the people who they're most likely to engage with, who are willing to call them, who are willing to email public comments. And that's not everyone. If you don't have a job or you're working three jobs or you have kids to take care of, you're not coming to a 2 p.m. zoning board meeting. And we know this now from repeated attempts to make these more accessible. During the pandemic, a lot of zoning board meetings, a lot of public meetings went on Zoom. That did not increase the representativeness of these meetings. Why? Because even that is too high of a barrier. If you have to join zoning board meetings to make sure your interests are heard, you are basically saying only someone with all the time in the world is ever going to engage in this sort of political uh, jockeying. And I also will say this, we now have recent polling that indicates when you ask people, who do they want to be in charge of housing? The local government, their state government, their federal government, do you know what they say? They essentially say, we don't care, we want someone to fix it. So the question is not, does some level of government have the right to handle local control or state control or whatever it is over uh, housing decisions. It's which level of government has the capacity, ability, and political will to actually fix this problem. And I think it's 
extremely abundantly clear in reporting I've done across this country from Montana to Washington to California to New York to uh, Connecticut to Maryland to DC that you do not have the will at the hyper local level to make these decisions that need to be made these difficult political decisions that need to be made and local government officials are increasingly aware of this and wanting the state to step in and take more action no matter what they say in their, you know, political, you know, uh, uh, League of Cities meetings, you do see a clear need for this to change. And the last thing I want to leave you with is a little bit of hope here. Um, none of these problems are insurmountable. Texas and Florida are not places where there are more people who care about low-income renters. It is not the case that Republican states and cities have figured out this magical way of financing affordable housing. What these places have is the political will to allow things to be built, even if they're not perfect. Of the top 10 states that are building the most housing, and this is these stats are normalized to per 1,000 existing homes. So it's not just the biggest states, but the top 10 states that are building more housing, seven are straightforwardly Republican states. Idaho, Utah, Texas, South Carolina, South Dakota, Tennessee. The remaining three have Democratic governors, but are at best purple states, Arizona, North Carolina, and Colorado. Where does Connecticut rank? Only three states are building fewer homes than Connecticut. And when you look at the states that are building the fewest homes, you repeatedly see the same pattern. These are largely democratically led states with large numbers of progressives governing and engaging in politics. And this is, I think, a damning problem for liberal America, that you see Republicans able to provide working families access to housing in the way that these states cannot. And you see it in the way that people are voting for with their feet. When you see the people leaving California for Texas or for Arizona or for Florida or New York and the New York metro area for Florida or for Georgia, um, what you see in survey data is the number one reason people will give to the U.S. Census for why they're moving is because housing costs are too high in these states. These people are trading away any of the rights and benefits and amenities that these states have, whether it's the nice weather in California, whether it's paid family leave, whether it's access to abortion care, whether it's fair treatment for LGBTQ individuals, all of these rights, if they come at the price of high rental payments and high housing costs, people will not pay them. And we are consigning those people to live in states where they do not have access to these rights, where they do not have access to Medicaid expansion, where they do not have access to abortion care. That, to me, is a question of what are actually the priorities of these democratically led states, because if their priorities are to maintaining high housing costs and neighborhood character, then they're doing great. But they are losing people every single day, and that means eventually they will destroy the very states that they were trying to protect. But again... This is something that can be solved easily. This is not a difficult problem. This isn't a technical problem like figuring out a new vaccine or figuring out a new scientific innovation. We know how to build housing. The question is entirely political will. Will there be a decision that that is more important than other priorities? Will there be a decision that is more important than maintaining ideological purity about the private market construction of new housing? Will we care more about housing people and giving them affordable housing than we do in blocking some people from making money? And that's the question that's before states like Connecticut. I hope that they answer this in a better way than they have in the past. Um, and that's my talk for today. And I'm, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Jerusalem. I see tons of virtual uh, celebration clapping for your words. Thank you so much. There's so much there, so much uh, here, and questions are coming in the Q&A box. A reminder for folks to put your questions in the Q&A box, and I will do my best to try to sort through them and pitch them to you, Jerusalem, and we'll work through as many as we can in the next 20 some odd minutes. I'll start with, um, not surprisingly, several questions about the impacts of the incoming administration. Um, you know, with Trump's return to office next year, many folks are expecting renewed resistance to housing regulations seen as restrictive or interventionist. So can you talk a little bit about how states and municipalities can protect some of the progressive housing policies put in place 
in a, an increasingly conservative federal landscape, particularly when it comes to, uh, I would say, financing and fair housing concerns. Yeah, I mean, one of the good things about housing is that because it's kind of so much at the state and local level, um, new administrations can be reduce a lot of help. Like, for instance, I could imagine there's going to be harm um, uh, when when taxes are being debated next year, that things like LIHTC or home uh, tax credits might be at risk. But that only increases the need to to address the levers that people do actually have. So if there's less access for affordable housing developers to use LIHTC or home credits or whatever it is in order to make these uh, projects pencil, then it becomes even more important to reform the permitting process and the zoning regulations that are increasing the cost of housing right now. Um, that is something that I think that there is potentially room in this administration or within Republican leadership in the state Senate and House um, for interest in. One of the good things about housing is that it kind of cuts against both, you know, partisan coalitions so you can find unlikely bedfellows. Essentially, in every single major pro-housing reform across this country has been a bipartisan um, effort. Um, there's not been one that's been solely on the Democratic side or solely on the Republican side, um, even in very deep blue and deep red states. And it's because of that unlikely coalition. As a result, I think that there is room for people to advocate at the national level to maintain LIHTC funding, home funding, etc., when it comes to fair housing, one of the things I think is really important is recognizing that HUD has, I mean, this is Nicole Hannah-Jones's reporting from ProPublica many years ago, HUD has never really tried to enforce the Fair Housing Act because it's been so politically unpalatable. Both in Democratic and Republican administrations, you've seen kind of a reluctance to really engage here because of the blowback you can get from local and state governments. What that means then is that fair housing needs to be something that's actually committed to um, as much as possible in the politics that we're creating here. Um, and people are more willing to be in favor of fair housing when they feel like it's not taking something from them. We really activate people's fear response, zero sum thinking, um, you know, backlash against minorities or immigrants when we provide for scarcity. When we say there's not enough to go around, I'm going to hoard it for me and my kids. I don't want anyone else getting access to it. And that increases violations. Um, I wrote this article like many years ago, actually, for Vox, which was about these uh, buyer love letters, which were when, you know, people are trying to buy new houses, they're going to, you know, they're bidding, they're trying to outbid their their competitors, etc. But they're also sending these love letters, which say things like, hi, like, you know, I have like, you know, I don't I have four kids and I'm Catholic and like, please rent to me. And they'll put in a lot of things that create room for fair housing violations, because perhaps now the homeowner is discriminating based on these characteristics that we think are, are that we have said are illegal. And the reason why these buyer levelers have become so popular is actually because of the scarcity of housing options available to people that have given so much power to property owners to discriminate in the market. So increasing supply is such an important tool for addressing um, for addressing this problem. But, you know, I think it's clear that like AFFH, right when Trump came into power in um, 2016, um, the AFFH regulations that the Obama administration had been working on were reversed. I expect to see some similar things happening now as well. But, you know, I, I, I honestly will say this, that like regardless of who was in charge of uh, of the federal administration, whether it was going to be Kamala Harris or Donald Trump, the action was going to be in the states to address housing at every level. Um, there are some things that can be harmful that are, of course, and some things that are beneficial that could happen from the federal level. But at the end of the day, it's really in the hands of state and local officials. So let's talk a little bit about the state level. A couple of comments here about regions and cities in Connecticut not participating in development of affordable housing. You know, probably like many other states, you have regions of Connecticut that are producing housing at a higher rate than other regions. And you've talked a lot about moving land use authority to the state level as a potential solution to overcoming NIMBYism. Um, and, you know, we know when you talked about folks' serious concerns that it that it risks ignoring local context and specific needs. So how do we in Connecticut address the challenge of ensuring statewide policies are sensitive to local contexts? You know, we're 169 towns. That's kind of a big part of Connecticut's identity. How do we ensure that they're sensitive to local context without being co-opted by this localized resistance? 
So the first thing that I'll say is that every time I go to a new state, um, everyone always tells me that they're they're very special, that they're very different, and that, you know, maybe that would work somewhere else, but that doesn't work here. And the thing I say is when you look across the world, um, the only uh, country, highly developed country that has this level of localization is the United States of America. Canada doesn't do this. Sweden doesn't do this. France doesn't do this. Germany doesn't do this. We don't. They don't have thousands upon thousands of local governments with political authority that are interfering with the ability to make clear decisions about land use regulations. That's just not how it works anywhere else. So, like, we should set that baseline of like this is an anomaly and not normal and it's not the only way to actually hear people's preferences on the ground and then also i ask what sorts of things are local government uh, local officials hearing that are not transmittable to state officials about these policies if i say there shouldn't be parking minimums across the entire state of connecticut that's nothing to do with whether it's hartford or it's greenwich like that is just a question of do parking minimums work at creating healthy communities. And regardless of the context, they don't. And when you see minimum lot sizes, right? When you think about these issues, why should there be anywhere in Connecticut where one minimum lot size is more than 10,000 square feet? And when I ask these questions of people, I haven't talked to a lot of people in Connecticut, so I can't really speak to that. Often they're just saying, well, this is the way my community looks right now. And then the question has to be, is that a more important reason than the other reasons why we want to build more housing? And it's not to say that I don't understand an individual being afraid of change. I think the most normal thing in the world is that people fear change. They, they fear change in their healthcare markets. They fear change in their housing markets. They fear, fear change in their employment markets. That is extremely normal. But then the question has to be, yes, you're afraid of change, but either way, things are gonna change. Either home prices are gonna go higher, people are gonna be priced out of your community, your kids can't live near you, um, fewer and fewer people uh, will be able to work in these areas. When you're talking about very high expensive areas, you can't get workforce housing in these places either. They can't get access to their restaurants, to new small businesses that aren't popping up because it's too expensive. So that's one way that your community can change. Or you can have a few more smaller homes. You can have some more apartment buildings or some more townhouses and more duplexes and things like that. And that's another way that your community can change, but it can actually be accessible to the very people that you want to be able to live there, your children, your grandparents who have to downsize, these types of things are how we need to articulate this to people. And so I do think that um, uh, I think that states should rely a lot on survey data and also in uh, making it possible for people to, of course, still do public comment, but it should still be a question of what then is our priority. Once we have all of these people who say they're afraid of change, afraid of development, does that mean we just stop the process? If it does, it, it is a choice that Connecticut will make for its own future. So your article, um, Community Input is Bad, actually, was one that we discussed a lot here at the partnership. And I know lots of folks have, have read it. And you discussed those pitfalls of conventional public input. And you talked a little bit about survey data and um, public comment periods at the statewide level. Do you see other uh, ethical ways to incorporate community perspectives that don't disproportionately empower certain groups, examples from other communities and other states, and how we could um, reimagine our community input processes so that they really serve to genuinely include people rather than inadvertently exclude marginalized or sometimes advertently exclude marginalized voices. Yeah, I think the increased reliance on survey data is really, really, really positive here. Um, asking people in survey data just and this is hard for local governments, but states should be doing this, but running surveys and asking people, what is the most important issue to you? Are there places that you wanna maintain free from development? Um, but also you should still have, I think these public meetings where people can still show up and talk. There's nothing wrong with having access to that space if someone has strong feelings. It's just what information are you taking from that then? Are you taking, there are some people who are kind of always opposed to housing. Is it that, oh, we can easily, uh, allay people's fears by saying we're holding, you know, these important, uh, you know, watersheds free from development that will never be developed. Is it providing these clear contexts? But I think that the important thing here is just that, like, in many contexts, we expect representative democracy to be the way that public voices are heard. You still can call your congressman about foreign policy. You can call your congressman about health care. You can call your governor about, um, you know, employment issues in your state. But you don't get to veto it. 
In the same way, I think we should think of housing as similar to these other issues. I don't get a veto about foreign policy. I don't get to say, no, I don't think we should send um, Ukraine money to be able to fight Russia. I don't get to block that because I've elected a president and uh, Congress. And what that means then is you should still have a way to say no. And I think this is really where a lot of court reform needs to happen because the way that you get minority interest, and I mean this in like terms of like any minority, right? Because it could be the case that developing a ton of housing across Connecticut is great, but it could still hurt individual people or individual communities. And the way that we traditionally resolve that in the United States is we allow people to sue, to block and to um, get remedies from governments that hurt their rights and hurt their, their property values or whatever it is um, without fair compensation. And the problem is now we've said, okay, yeah, you can sue and you can delay indefinitely, even if you don't have a reasonable argument. But that's a question for court reform. How can we change these laws to make it clear that if the government, you know, unfairly removes you from your home, if the government, um, you know, has hurt your environment by by allowing for development to happen without the proper procedures, and thus all of this, uh, you know, important conservation area has been ruined. How do you sue to prevent that and stop that from happening without allowing people to take advantage of that process? And that's something that a lot of people are working on right now in Minnesota, for instance. Uh, Minneapolis, I think, became really famous in 2017 for being the first city to eliminate single family zoning. Um, and they followed that up with a bunch of regulatory reforms at the Minneapolis City Council level to try to make it easier to build new housing, including eliminating parking minimums. Um, they were sued by a few homeowners um, alongside a local birding group um, to uh, block the development, uh, to block all of these changes under the Minnesota Environmental Rights Act. A bunch of environmentalists got together who were very, very protective of environmental statutes. But the C local Sierra Club chapter and a local gr uh, 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 coalition of environmental groups got together and said, we want dense housing. We don't think that these laws should be weaponized against dense housing. We're going to work together to rewrite the Minnesota Environmental Rights Act in order to make sure it continues to protect the environment and people can still sue if there's real harm to the environment, but you can't just block new housing from existing. So those sorts of reforms I think are really important so that the majority need for more housing gets built, but individuals still have the knowledge that they can stop um, the worst excesses from having happening to them. So um, you talk about supply skepticism in your work and you talked about it today and, and local housing debates often pit that empirical evidence against experiential claims um, by folks who are skeptical or, or have concerns about new development. So what communication strategies, you just talked about an alliance between partners, what communication strategies or partnerships have you seen work to help bridge the divide between this data-driven policy recommendations and the skepticisms, uh, concerns, or preferences of communities? Yeah. First, I'll say is that when we've started surveying people um, more in recent years, that you do see broad based support for building more homes. Um, there's still concern when people are um, a new development may be coming to your community. That's always you know, the case. People are, are worried about one in their community. But when you ask people at this kind of broad level, like, do you think it's important for um, the country building more homes? They are increasingly supportive of this. And I think it's in large part due to a public conversation that's been happening for the last couple of decades, pushing for the development of new homes and understanding that to be a good and important thing. And in particular, a lot of people had the experience in 2020 and 2021 of themselves or a family member searching for new houses housing and seeing just how few homes were even available. I think my favorite anecdote of that time period was there was like a, someone had to hire a bouncer in DC at an open house because people were just like so unruly that they could not contain themselves in this line. And when you see those sorts of things, when you see people behaving that way, you just are, you're, that's what scarcity feels like. That's how people are acting under conditions of scarcity. And so when you think about um, uh, uh, convincing then people or how do you make it easier, more palatable for people to to kind of think about more supply is a good thing. I think that like coalitional validators coming together who are not just from the private market is really important. When I tell people that I talk to affordable housing developers all the time who are 
building 100% affordable housing. That's all they want to build. That's all they care about. That's all they're working on. And those people are routinely impacted by a very difficult permitting process, a very difficult land use regime that makes it impossible to even conceive of many of the great ways in which um, housing can be built, um, whether those are duplexes or multiplexes or affordable or, or, or apartments. People are really receptive to hearing that. And then I think also bringing validators in who live in these homes, when these places get developed, who ends up living there? Having those conversations out loud is really important. Environmental organizations, anti-poverty organizations, these coalitions are developing in a lot of states across the country because people are seeing how important it is to talk about this. But I also think at the local level, talking to large employers is really important. So hospitals, universities, these are places that are severely impacted by these regulations. Um, universities can't expand or provide housing to their students. There are students who are increasingly living in their cars in places places like Berkeley, California, because their schools are literally prohibited from building student housing for them, and they're not able to access the private market housing that's way too expensive in these sorts of college towns. And so engaging these people, like if you're in a college town, your entire town, like Prince, I was just in Prince, New Jersey, where there's a lot of NIMBYism, the entire town's economy essentially is based in the university, and people don't really fully um, have a grasp of how much it's going to impact them if you can't build enough um, for them. I mean, University of, I was in Gainesville, Florida, working on this very issue. And the University of Florida is a huge employer there and hasn't been as vocal as it should be on these issues. So I think that those sorts of partnerships and pulling together people across um, industries, across issue areas to talk about the need for building infill housing is, is a great way to, to start. But I think I'll also say, you know, Nancy Pelosi said this about the Affordable Care Act. She said, you know, like people will learn to love or something like she says, like, you know, people will learn to love it when it's existed. And this is like a huge gaffe at the time. Right. Um, and that's true. Now, Affordable Care Act is it's extremely protected by individuals. And I think this is true of development as well. People might oppose it when it's hypothetical. But most of the time, once it becomes a part of your landscape, once you have a friend who lives there, once you yourself have considered living there, it just becomes something people are willing to do. That doesn't mean that every development is good good or won't have a problem with it. But I think in general, we should understand that when you bias people against change, it's kind of like a vicious cycle. And the opposite is true when you became, make people more amenable to new development, to new changes in their communities. They realize, oh, I was so worried about this uh, low income uh, affordable housing being built over there, but actually there hasn't been any increase in crime. And there's a really nice lady who actually now works at the corner store who I like. And so providing a positive cycle and reinforcing the idea that change is possible, newcomers are beneficial, this new housing development benefits you and yours is really important. So you just talked about uh, density, and uh, I think you said infill, but a question that we hear often, somebody from the audience said, if a town is already built out, so most of the property is already one to two acre minimum single family homes, how do we find the opportunity for building? So um, no community is built out. I will say this, there's no such thing as a community that's built out. There is a great book that's coming out by an Atlantic editor, um, Yoni Applebaum soon, that talks about how people in the 1870s were talking about how the country had, the frontier had been found and there was nowhere else to build and the country was full. We can't have any more immigrants. And it's 1870 something that they're, <laughs> they're making these arguments. And this happens in the 1920s, this happens in the 1950s, it's happening now. There is no town that is full. Um, and I mean this by saying that, um, yes, it may be the case that when you change all of your land use regulations, like you could eliminate all regulations outside of health and safety ones and nothing will get built in the immediate term because you've built a bunch of new single family homes. But supply side policies work on the time scale of decades. They don't work immediately. They don't just mean that the next day you change your land use code and all of a sudden a bunch of new housing is developed. Of course, even right now, places aren't even built up to their allowable level of land use. Um, you know, like there are empty lots that are being underserved. There are places that are clearly being underutilized relative to their potential. But if you say, hey, you know, when these homes can be redeveloped, if someone wants to redevelopment, they're allowed to redevelop them as duplexes. They're allowed to redevelop them with ADUs in the backyard. When you create the potential and you tell the private market and the nonprofit developers that you can basically 
propose whatever you like. There's a bunch of buy right housing options that are available to you. The communities respond. I think the most important um, uh, example of this is in California. So it's 1980 something when the first additional dwelling unit, which if everyone doesn't know, that just means like a mother-in-law suite in your backyard or converting your garage into an apartment or like on a single family home lot, like a smaller um, housing unit that can also exist um, separate from that main house. They try to legalize ADUs in like 1980 something, and it takes 30 years of new laws. Um, actually, almost, yeah, yeah, 30 something years of new laws for ADUs to really start being developed. And that's because there are all of these different regulations they have to deal with. So a locality will say, yeah, you can build ADUs as long as you make sure that the lot that it sits on is at least 10,000 square feet. But like the average home was 7,000 square feet. So there were basically no allowable lots for ADUs. But once they'd worked through all of these kinds of exclusionary methods of blocking ADU development, a bunch of innovation happens. Tons of new small businesses prop up, small developers crop up saying, oh, I know a way of building ADUs, or I have an idea for how I could do this or how I could help people finance this. Banks see this as a potential product they could help invest in. They say like, okay, I'm happy to invest in the startup. I'm happy to figure out a way to do this. Let's make a bet on this group. And the private market and the nonprofit market change as a result of those regulations. But that takes many, many years of liberalized land use regulations for that to change. And in 2022, one in five new homes in California was an accessory dwelling unit. That's 20% of new homes with ADUs. And that's something that nobody expected. It's a massive success story in Southern California for affordable, uh, uh, more affordable housing option types. And um, yeah, so I just think that at some level here, like, yes, I understand that people have this desire right now to to change their land use codes or to build as much as possible. But, um, you know, if you don't see this as a problem of time scales of, of a decade or more, um, it took us decades to build ourselves out of into this crisis. And it's going to take us quite a bit of time to build ourselves out of it, too. And it requires that level of patience. I think it also changes, though, the developer um, calculus. Like if you're looking at um, a town in Connecticut that's built out mostly kind of like these single family homes over a few acres and you say um, that's all you can build. then of course, there's no development appetite for those those for redeveloping those properties. But if you tell them, oh, you're allowed to build a townhome development and you can have like 10 townhomes on a parcel of land of an acre or 20 townhomes on a parcel of an acre. Now, developers are like, hey, let me run those numbers, actually. And it may actually be worth it to knock down one of these houses and build a townhome development. You don't know what that world will look like. You don't know when interest rates are going to come down and make it possible for those kinds of ideas to flourish. But you want to make sure that your land use code and your building codes are ready for that moment. Are there any states that have passed a uh, statewide maximum minimum lot size? Um, I think that the only place that really attempted this was Arizona. Arizona, and this is a very tragic story, actually, um, a bipartisan group of, of legislators get, um, including both very progressive people and very Trumpy people, get together. They work on a minimum lot size bill um, that would cap minimum lot sizes at 10,000 square feet, I believe. Um, it's called the Arizona Starter Homes Act. It gets through both houses, and then it's vetoed by the Democratic governor of, of Arizona. Um, and that is a situation where I think, I mean, I've written a couple of articles about this decision to veto the bill. You see a bunch of people coming in and making pretty spurious, like NIMBY arguments and, and convincing her. But I think at, at core, um, obviously, I can't speak to her state of mind or whatever, but I think what's happening there is that Democrats are not used to being on the side of pro-housing development. And she saw a bill which was spearheaded by Republicans and decided that she wasn't gonna, she wasn't gonna sign it. And um, to me, that's really tragic. Um, I haven't seen, I think someone should look to see if Washington State or Montana have done anything statewide on this. I don't think there's been one as so sweeping as just one maximum across the state. I think they usually are um, kind of carving out like certain size cities or localities in order to do something like this. But Washington and Montana, I think are two really good states where you've seen a lot of action on this issue. Thank you. So we're getting close to time. I had a, a great question submitted around homeownership that I thought was interesting, you know, is that homeownership is such a large part of generational wealth building, obviously, in our country. So um, the audience member wants to know, how do we make meaningful progress in affordability without changing how people build and transfer generational wealth and ensure their retirement? You want to speak a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, all of the, all these questions are great. That's a that's a really great question, too. Um, 
I think a couple things. One is that I used to think that most, if not all, NIMBYism was essentially at core a concern about property values because there is a tension that this that this questioner has raised, right? Like if you're trying to keep values going up, then do you really care about affordability coming down? Like you kind of have to pick one. You can't have values go up forever and also affordability is there for anyone who needs it. Like that's that's a very difficult equation to sort of to sort of thread cleanly. But after I did a bunch more reporting, it became clear that people are using property value as a shorthand. People will say in meetings, oh, I'm so concerned about my property values. I This is not fair. You're hurting my property values. This is the language we've given people to express a concern about ruining their neighborhood. Because most people don't buy homes with the intention of like just turning around a quick buck on it. They want their home to like, you know, maintain at least a store of value and keep up with inflation. They don't want to lose money on that home, right? But their goal is to live in that home, maybe to pass it on to their kid. Even it's actually not even that normal for people to borrow off their home for retirement or to send their kid to college. They want their house to be shelter and they want it to be uh, a, 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 you know, insurance against the worst things that can happen to them. But they don't want it to be like just some asset that they're trading as if it's meaningless to them. And so when people say property values, I think that they often actually mean, I know what it means to live in a nice neighborhood. I have been told by books. I've been told by movies. I've been told by politicians. I've been told by courts that have told me that apartment buildings are nuisances and harms and, 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 and negative externalities on my community. So I know that it looks like single family homes on large lots of land with setbacks <laughs> between the houses and setbacks from the street and picket fences and things that look different than that clearly are a problem and are degrading my home. I, and the, the places where I think this is the most complicated conversation is particularly in middle class black communities that have Prince George's County in Maryland, I think one really good example of this, where you have seen a lot of people finally being able to buy into home ownership. And now everyone's trying to let them say, to, to build multifamily housing in their area. And they're like, wait a second, we just got to buy into the American dream and now you're ruining it. And the really core problem there is, is like, how do we then define the American dream to mean more than just your house is detached like, can it mean more than your house is detached from the other home next door? Can there be the American dream in these townhomes? And I live in Washington, D.C. I live in an attached row house. My sister lives in Philadelphia. She couldn't afford to buy a house in New York where she spent 10 years of her life living and working and making friends. She moved to Philadelphia. She lives in an attached row house. And I'm, we're like very happy here. Our neighbors are very happy here. They have kids and showing these stories and making it clear to people that like that's possible and that's what's being blocked. I think many people don't even realize that the very houses that like make their cities, you know, home, like the row house in Pennsylvania or in Philadelphia and actually lots large parts of Pennsylvania or in, in, in New York City, these like brownstones, things like that. These literal structures could not be built under current zoning or would require a variance in order to get that built. When you make it clear in those terms, I think appealing to those structures can be really helpful for people. But I do think a massive redefinition of what it means to have made it is really important. And, you know, Americans will go to Europe or East Asia all the time and just like go marvel at the beautiful urbanism and don't even realize that that is banned in their own housing um, markets back home. So I think really really using art and using culture to explain this to people is going to be an important part of the process. And we already start seeing it happening. Thank you so much. You've done such a, a beautiful job for all of us this morning, highlighting our consistent ability to prioritize people's preferences over people's needs. And, you know, you talked about what will we let stand in the way of building and what will we let stand in the way of our communities and people and that it really will take political will. So I just uh, wanna thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and your passion and your time and talent with us today here in Connecticut. Um, thank thank you. you so much. We hope you'll come visit us soon uh, in person. And um, for all the folks on, I'm sorry, we didn't get to all of the questions. Um, I We got them though, so we can forward them on. And, and if you didn't submit it anonymously, we can follow up with you. We'll take a short lunch break now. We'll meet back online at 1130 for our legislative roundtable where we can continue this discussion with um, our, our elected officials. So thank you so much, Jerusalem. Round of applause for you. And thank we'll you all. I really soon. appreciate coming on to join you on Zoom. I hope you guys have great sessions. Um, and, and yeah, I'll be in Connecticut. <laughs> all right. Take all care. Right. Thanks, Bye -bye. everybody.